thanks for being here. Uh, staring into the abyss, dark side of crime fighting, security, professional intelligence. Uh, what I'm going to do, it's a longer talk as usual. It was longer for Black Hat, so I'm going to try to hit the high points. You pick up the uh, CD, and there are, I believe, about 34 pages of documentation supporting what I'm saying. So some of it I will simply refer to and trust you if you're interested in seeing that I'm not making it up. Look at the CD, and you'll see the support for it. Uh, it's uh, got several, let me get this stuff out of the way, it's several parts, uh, and so I'll signal when I'm starting a new one. Uh, the beginning is about the fact that I can't get my mind around that this is my 16th uh, DEF CON, and that I keynoted, <laughs> yeah, that's for longevity, right, that I am living, and, and yet there are markers that tell you how you are doing along the way. Uh, within the first couple, uh, London Sunday Telegraph had a piece on something I'd said and it's referred to me as a, uh, uh, a father figure for online culture. I thought that was cool. And then about a decade later, uh, some hackers said, you know, you really ought to change that to uh, a grandfather figure for online culture. And then, <laughs> and then last year during my talk, someone tweeted, you may think Richard Thiem is just a deranged old man wandering about the con, but he does actually have something worthwhile to say. And uh, those of you who are young and are amused by this story, just know that this too will be the dots of your trajectory, which will inevitably project into the future. You cannot even imagine as, uh, as your chemistry changes. But keep in mind that what chemicals take away, chemicals can put back. Uh, there is... <laughs> Blessed be the names of those chemicals. <laughs> okay, so ideally, as we follow this trajectory over 20 years of DEF CON, or 19, uh, we have a greater sophistication, greater sense of nuance, greater sense of the grayness of all things. Uh, we hear about gray hat hackers as if they're one of three. Let me tell you the real definitions. A, uh, a black hat hacker translates into a hacker. Right? A gray hat hacker is a hacker who knows when it's appropriate to fudge the truth. A white hat hacker is a hacker who put the truth down somewhere and doesn't remember where they put it. <laughs> uh, it's all gray. It is all gray hat hacking because hacking and computer science and computer technology and infosec is a subsection of society and society is all gray and the longer you live the grayer it gets and the more the blacks and whites dissolve into the uh, irreducible middle. This talk is not like many of them are, the useful talks, the practical talks, the talks that tell you three things you can do on Monday morning when you get back to work. What I'm trying to illuminate with this is the fuzzier or grayer landscape of our professional and personal lives. And as we grow older, we see they are very much the same uh, for a well-integrated human. So that, ideally, when you come to some of those crossroads in the future uh, that this talk will illuminate, you will remember some of the things I said because the decisions you will have to make at those moments are not trivial or easy. Because the world in which we now live is not trivial or easy. And information security is not trivial or easy. Gosh, there's just so many information security professionals. 2010, Frost and Sullivan said, there are 2.28 million information security professionals in the world, to which a experienced and truth-telling security practitioner said, then it sounds a lot better when you say information security professional to make air quotes. <laughs> because uh, that's not what they all are. We are all in this together, all hackers, all hacking is gray hat, and nevertheless, as an industry, which is really what is still this, uh, this is still about. Black Hat, it's really about that. The industry, like all industries, has developed a narrative which is self-serving. It defines the view of reality which is permissible to speak. It defines the paradigm. And when you define the paradigm up front, you don't have to worry about the answers because you're determining the very questions that can be asked. And those things which, of which we are not allowed to speak we do not have to worry about how people feel or think about them because they never surface. They remain anomalous or a source of cognitive dissonance or background fuzzy noise. But the fact is, those in the picture of the narrative don't see that there's a frame 
and there is a ground of being for the narrative, and that's what I want to illuminate, if I can, some of it, the context, not the content which it is habitual to hear about here or at Black Hat. Things have changed over the years. Years ago, I referred to the creation of the digital space as resulting in real birds in digital cages. I came to that when I was asked by a uh, global public relations company way back when, when I started writing about this stuff in the 90s, email was so new that when someone got an email, it didn't even occur to them that the person writing it wasn't right there in their city. So I got an email from someone in London because they had read something I'd written for an English magazine and assumed I was in London. He asked me to come over for a drink after work to discuss uh, doing brand defense. And I called him and said, I'm in Milwaukee. I can't come over so easily but we can work, we didn't have words for it. We didn't say work remotely then, it was a new concept. But I said, I can do a lot of that from here. We can collaborate, tell me what brand defense is. He said, well, that's easy. If uh, we have a client, say, who's uh, a tobacco company, uh, I said, I see, you want me to build what we were learning to call websites that defend your client. And he said, no, no, no. We want you to build websites that attack our client from a multiple, multiplicity of points of view, and we'll give you enough information to be credible in your attacks, but not so much that it will be a smoking gun that could bring serious damage to our client, and therefore you will collect in those websites, the real birds in digital cages, the people who are opposed to our client, and inflect the conversation, alter it so that it becomes essentially harmless in the end, and we will turn the digital cage and the birds, because they have the illusion of the freedom of flying that comes from flapping, will think they are free and flying in fact. So I called those real birds in digital cages. He wanted me to go into Usenet groups, which existed. So how many of you know what a Usenet group is? All right, not, not bad. I was talking to a young whippersnapper who was trying to get me out of my literary mindset and into transmedia. And I said, well, the person who introduced us, we met during the days of the bulletin board, and he said, what is a bulletin board? <laughs> and I said, you know, this was before Google. It's when we used Gopher. And predictably, he said, what is Gopher? <laughs> uh, deranged old man wandering about the con, <laughs> lost in his memories. So he wanted me to go into Usenet groups using what we didn't yet call NIMS to create false personas uh, we didn't call them screen presences, uh, and, and inflect the conversation so if it got too sticky or close to something that would be damaging, the, kill the cat, or set fire to the curtains, or do something that will distract people from what they're thinking. You probably recognize this now as the real world in which we live, the virtually inflected world in which people project themselves into virtual spaces because we evolved to be trusting of our senses, and so we think that what we see is what's there, and the bottom line of everything I, I speak about and write about is that nothing is what it seems. It really, really isn't. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is just what's so. Nothing is what it seems. It's what's so. It's also so what. So that's not news. Well, now, instead of digital birds in real cages with the advent of social media, what we really have are real flocks of birds in digital cages. And in addition to the illusion of the freedom of flying, because when we look up or down or to either side, we see other wings flapping, we have the illusion of security because we're part of the herd. We're part of the hump of the humplings, the bell curve, uh, a word I think I created. Um, the hump of the bell curve, you know there's like 10% up front. Those are the masters of society who create environments and realities for us. And we're the 80% in the hump of the bell curve, humping along, humplings hump, that's what they know how to do. And then there's 10% at the end that are the dregs. And the masters keep the dregs, so the humplings will see the dregs and be grateful they're not the dregs and thank the masters for keeping them in the hump and not letting them fall back into the dregs, i.e. people who can't get work after three years or who have a lower standard of living or who are denigrated in many ways. And then everybody is happy except the dregs, but they serve a larger societal purpose by making the rest happy. So if you deconstruct their unhappiness, they too are happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they just don't know it, uh, so they get violent, you know. Uh, at any rate, providing that hump, providing that herd, providing that flock of illusory digital wings provides not only the illusion of freedom, but the illusion of security. And as the bigger and bigger cage turns, because we are part of a flock, we cannot even see the edges of the cage so far as that parallel universe from 
us. In other words, we are all assimilated. We cannot help being assimilated into the organizational structures or the larger cultural entities of which we become a part. Margaret Mead, great anthropologist, said years ago that it takes her a full year to learn again what she learns in one week when she enters a new culture. And the reason is when you come in new, you see it with beginner's eyes, as the Buddhists say. You see it fresh. You see that the cues you are used to responding to aren't there, but there are different cues. And you see it clearly, like the Terminator at the moon, over against the light and the darkness. You see the reels in the mountains of the cultural norms and behaviors in a different way. But after a week or so, she already unconsciously was assimilated into the culture to a degree that undermined her objectivity and ability to see, and it took longer and longer and longer to see more and more. And therefore, we go by the known but unwritten rules. You know that. In any organization, some of you belong to them, uh, there are four kinds of rules. There's uh, known and written, which are the, the manual they give you when you're hired and have to go through some organizational orientation. And they're known for a moment as you leaf through them, and then they go on the shelf and they become written but unknown uh, over time because you never consult them again. There are also unknown and unwritten, which are the deep cultural structures of our lives, the 98% of us that evolved and of which we are unconscious. So we don't have to worry about those, but the ones that govern the organizational life are the known but unwritten rules. And anybody who succeeds in anything is pretty good at picking up on and intuiting what are the known and unwritten rules and obeying them in order to advance in the organization and keep sustenance and livelihood alive. A friend of mine who's a cop and is also a Roman Catholic, this is not meant to denigrate the Roman Catholic Church and all its illustrious history, I'll just tell you what he said to me. He's a cop and he's a Catholic. He said, you know, my church and my police life work the same way. Uh, when you're a rookie, you know, you're watched. And as the dirty money comes through and the drug money doesn't all go back to the station and some of the coke gets bled off, or you go into an alley and you beat the living, you, you beat somebody, uh, and you're standing there waiting for your partners to finish kicking him into unconsciousness, they watch what you do. And if you're okay, you don't do anything. And the word goes around real quickly, you're okay, you're one of us. And if you are one of us, then you are elevated up through the structures. And when you reach the top, as Timothy Leary said, you never get the truth from the com company memo because you become so instantiated as an aspect of the company, you're like invasion of the body snatchers. Somebody put a seed pod under your bed in the night when you joined, and over time you become, you look like yourself, but pretty soon you only say the things the paradigm the company approves of allows you to say, and you don't say the other things at all. And, and so uh, you, become, uh, you become part of the Borg. Uh, and so my, my friend the cop said, that's who makes captain. Uh, you don't make captain if you don't protect the institutional life of the structure that advanced you and which you have by that point so internalized that you are it, like you become bishop. And this is why the culture of my church, he said, has become a global, he said it, I didn't say it. I don't know if I even believe something like this. He said a global criminal pedophile enterprise. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know anything about that, if that's true or not. But he said it's the same way. You come in and you see quickly, unless you're unconscious, what is going on. And if you say something, you go to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And if you don't say anything, you become Archbishop of New York or Boston or L.A. or Chicago. And it's, oh, that's just what's so. But in that case, because the evil is so deep, it's not so what. But at any rate, as an illustration of how organizational life assimilates us, it works pretty well. Well, the same thing happens in the so-called security space, the space of information security, and in the intelligence community, where groupthink permeates, percolates through the structures, and from externals, the input is, is minimized. So the weakest link in, of the chain is frequently the definition of the problem. And the definition of the problem, as Matt Blaze pointed out, is often not what we think it is. That's true not only about security, but it's also true about the security industry, industry itself. So the question I'm asking is, who are we really? What is the security space really? And what does our self-referential narrative about the industry include? And above all, like all paradigms, what does it exclude and allow us not even to think about saying, much less say? What is the rule base of the filter? And how well does it work at the perimeter? Because like computers themselves, the perimeter no longer exists. There is no perimeter defense if there's no perimeter. Uh, and there's nothing but Mobius strips interlacing with one another like parallel universes. 
So let's not be white hat hackers and forget where we put the truth. Let's simply identify what the truth is and articulate it. Nothing is harder to see than the truths we have come to see believe so deeply that we don't even see them because our narratives become self-referential, they're bounded by mutual self-interest, and they're characterized by a heavy dose of groupthink. Beliefs are fine. Beliefs are good. They're useful. Just don't believe in your beliefs. Just <laughs> hold them lightly. True of all beliefs. Notice, oh, oh, that's something I believe, and then let it go. Because we know now from neuroscience that we make decisions prior to uh, inventing the reasons we say we do them. The decisions take place unconsciously, they manifest, and then we say the reason I did that, and it's always, as Nietzsche said, in the war between pride and, tell and humility, uh, that's why autobiography is never trustworthy, pride always wins. So how do you change the paradigm? Well, once when I was in the church, I was in a leadership project in which we were discussing new paradigms for uh, clerical leadership in the Episcopal Church and after we brought in all the people from Silicon Valley and all the think tank people I and mean, somebody had money and funded this and the second year of a three-year project I was sitting there listening to the gabble of all these what we called cardinal rectors big churches you know I, I, I mean if you play it right you can do okay you know I was sitting in a million dollar rectory in Hawaii tending my parish my wife had a sign made that said the pastor is in with an arrow pointing to the beach blanket and uh, we're sitting in a million dollar house and that's when you realize you came to do good uh, and you did well, <laughs> you know. Uh, <coughs> so, so uh, an analysis of the deeper political and economic, economic structures will always reveal behaviors and beliefs in a different light and it will illuminate our mixed motives and the fact that legitimate and illegitimate enterprises interpenetrate one another deeply, like yin-yang. You know, there's black and white, and they interpenetrate, and the white becomes a little gray, and the black becomes a little white. The overworld and the underworld make up just one thing, one vanilla chocolate swirl of pudding, one complex system. And this also has a serious impact on security and intelligent practitioners, on our psyches, on our relationships, and our lives. When we refuse to face the dark side of what it is we do and its impact on us, then it has even more impact on us because the more you push it down, the harder it pushes back. Beware, Nietzsche said, lest you stare into the abyss, as you stare into the abyss, lest it stares into you. Cognitive dissonance is always present and it can lead to serious stress. But if you become conscious of it and work at resolving it or at least managing the contradictions in your life, it seems to work a little better. Uh, what is the goal of becoming conscious? Uh, a friend shared a story about an intelligence practitioner who, uh, as a result of someone he had recruited in another country as an agent, uh, the person was discovered, outed, tortured to death, died horrifically. The person who had recruited him, our guy, was uh, struck by it, burdened by it. He started drinking heavily. They had to take his clearances away for a while, put him on a different desk, and send him to a therapist. And I said, but where's the therapist? And he, well, the therapist is cleared by the agency, therefore assimilated into the culture of the agency. Uh, and I said, what is the goal of therapy? The goal of therapy, uh, the answer came back clearly, is to get the guy back into shape, to go back to the original desk and do the work again, which got him into trouble, psychologically speaking, in the first place. I said, well, that's not what I did counseling for for 20 years. When I did counseling, the goal was to enhance someone's ability to see the darkness in their own life, see all the contradictions, integrate them into a bigger self, and, and transcend with wholeness and integrity what they thought had been a burden. And he said, uh, that's not our goal. Our goal is for the guy to get, get back to work. We're not concerned with wholeness and integrity. And I said, so what happens if he can kind of work, but you're not sure if it all took? He said, then we watch him very, very, very carefully. <laughs> well, it has an effect on us. In the days before it became public, I was talking to people who were tortured, and I was talking to people who did the torturing. It started to affect me to listen to their stories. Uh, listening to someone who did torturing talk about, for example, the Uzbeks. You ever work with the Uzbeks? He said, it was a novelty when we told the Uzbeks that one of the purposes of torture was to get information. You got it? They didn't know that. They thought it was just something we do. And I was telling that to someone who'd been doing interrogation seriously and well for 17 years, and he said, 
the Uzbeks, my God, you ever work with the Turks? <laughs> Uh, by which he meant that all they want is a confession. There doesn't have to be a perp, there doesn't have to be a crime. There's a piece of paper, sign it. Oh, you don't want to sign it? Uh, that's the way it is. Listening to their stories, oops, deaths. The story of medical practitioners, doctors, falsifying death certificates when someone said, oops, lost them, heart attack. Uh, oops, deaths. And then used the information they gained from each instance of torture to advance the ability to do torture well the next time. This is medical experimentation on human beings, which was prohibited by Nuremberg, uh, but is practiced. Waterboarding is a red herring. It's an image of something we can imagine not being so bad, as Rumsfeld said, just dipping him in the water or something like that, as if choking to death almost is not so bad because we didn't kill him, except when we did. But the serious torture is not just water bordering. It's used as an image to distract people from the truth of what it is that we do. But it is not what we are allowed out here in the psychic space of, of America to talk about clearly. And so as a result, as Jane Wagner said, I'm getting more and more cynical all the time and I still can't keep up. What is it? What does it do to you to hear secrets or live with secrets and carry them as a burden? I had dinner in Washington once with a friend from FBI and a friend from NSA and they were talking about what it did to them and one of them said, imagine if you're listening to terrorists slit the throats of people in real time, you're hearing the horror and you go home at night and your wife says, how was your day and all you were allowed to say was fine, dear. It was fine. So one of the impacts of the dark side is secondary trauma. A therapist told me to read about trauma when I tried to engage her, a bioethicist, in a project to look at torture at least before it was in the public domain. <clears throat> and of course they wouldn't because it would jeopardize their professional positions. So I read about trauma and what it did to you and I went back and I said I've read all the sequelae of trauma uh, that are predictable. And she said, you know, I wanted you to read that. And I said, sure, because I'm dealing with people who are traumatized. And she said, anything else? And I said, no, because when you're in it, you can't see it. And she said, you're showing all the symptoms of secondary trauma. My wife said, I could have told you that a year ago, <laughs> but she was my wife. <laughs> so, you know, you listen, uh, but you don't listen. Yeah, but when a therapist you don't know says it, you say, oh, I didn't know that. My point is that by virtue of the work we do in the security space, we often, all of us, and all of us in America, by virtue of knowing and having these conversations, if we dare to have them, begin to show the symptoms of secondary trauma. It distorts our view of reality, it makes it more binary, and it makes us more paranoid. Not just appropriately paranoid, but wondering uh, what is really going on all the time. And then when they call you a conspiracy theorist for wondering, uh, it makes it even worse because you're not allowed to evolve a conversation, civil discourse about the truth in order to know what it is because the one thing that holds true is it does set you free to tell the truth and to know the truth and integrate it into your life. So hopefully this analysis will make us think twice before we use the buzzwords and jargon of our profession, words like security itself and defense like when they changed the Department of War to the Department of Defense before going into 150 countries with a military presence as we have now, or words like terrorism or cyber war, words which are weasel words designed to create a paradigm which we unthinkingly articulate and in which we unthinkingly live. One example of what it does to us is this article which appeared um, on Dark Reading. Security pros may be ready to crack under growing pressure. Faced with securing personal devices and a growing base of threats, security pros feel overwhelmed, ISC2 survey reports. What it is about is the fact that when you're doing a job that you know can't be done, it causes not only trauma, but it breaks down your ability to function effectively. It reminded me of the story in John Hersey's Hiroshima. Uh, after the blast, there was a flash of light and a doctor noticed two, three people coming into the office, their arms peeling and bleeding and burned, and he started to treat them as he would anyone who came into the office with those symptoms. 
But when he turned around, there were five or ten more, and he tried to treat them, but then there were twenty more and thirty more, and he looked out the window, and hundreds were streaming down the street, burned and bleeding toward his office. And he was reduced to someone who could only go from one to the other to the other, saying, there, 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 there. The security industry, there, there, it'll be okay. There, there. But is it in fact implementing in the meantime the structures of security that will give security or is it simply carrying out the de facto commission which now the intelligence community itself has become commissioned to do not by any state because they're dissolving as the boundaries around them dissolve but by the fact of their lives in the trenches where they exchange information with one another in an effort like a thermostat to maintain some kind of equilibrium in the global body politic so that chaos, which is always threatening to break out at any bubble or aperture, will not break out. The bottom line of the security world is to be able to assure people that the world in which they wake up tomorrow will be pretty much like the world in which they went to sleep. That's a different commission than creating, implementing, and sustaining security. So, hence the title, whoever battles monsters should take care not to become a monster too. You stare long enough into the abyss, the abyss will stare right back at you. Or the way the sign put it at Sandia National Labs, do not look directly into the laser beam with your remaining eye. <laughs> Pretty good. Okay, so security has a context, and what I want to do is turn a little context into content and illuminate the slightly bigger box into which we say we're going when we're going out of the box. It's really just a bigger box. We never get to the end of the biggest boxes of all, the ground of being itself. But Eddie Bernays created context. Do you remember Eddie Bernays? Uh, I like to use his example that the publishers asked him to help with selling books, so he went to bright intellectual people, Nobel Prize winners, said his literacy relevant to America. This is the 1920s. They all said, yes, 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 signed off on that. Called together architects, builders, contractors, said, do you want to help build an America viable in the 20th century? Yes, 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 they all signed up. As a result, anyone coming in to an apartment building or house after the 1920s and not before would often find what they agreed to build, which were built-in bookshelves. And then when people came into those apartments or houses, without thinking or seeing it, they bought books. You've got a bookshelf, you put on a book. Context into content. Unseen, digital cage, go in, fly, buy books. So, as I say, I want you to believe in your beliefs, but contextualize them differently. Hold them differently. And that does not often happen at security conferences where your beliefs are reinforced and repeated so much that you actually believe in your beliefs. The price, James Baldwin said, one pays for pursuing any profession or calling is an intimate knowledge of its ugly side. Now, I learned that growing up in Chicago. Worked with my alderman until I was uh, through college. I was never once asked to do something legal. You know, typical was when they asked if I wanted to be a, a, a precinct captain. I was 18. I said, well, yeah, but where's Kitty going? They said, oh, Kitty's still on. I said, well, how can I be precinct captain? Kitty, our precinct captain, is still on. He said, oh, no, no, no. I was so naive. We need a Republican precinct captain. Uh, so you can destroy campaigns, undermine people, and report back as an infiltrator and spy. Uh, the problem was that I was 18, you had to be 21 to be a precinct captain. He said, that's not an issue. That's, that's for the document department, uh, <laughs> as you know. So the bottom line is you, you grew up in that environment. I woke up one day in the middle of my young life and said, my God, the father of every friend I have is doing something illegal. One was in jukeboxes, you know, the Seberg story. <clears throat> now that kid is the director of security for Seberg, and he directs security, all right. Uh, offers you cannot refuse is what they were making to people. Others were in gambling equipment, I found out. One was distributing porno. Porno in those days was 16 millimeter films, black and white. You ran on noisy projectors. Uh, not nearly as efficient or, or effective as just being able to put on your headphones, close the door, and say, I'm going to be working on this for a while. Right? <laughs> God bless the digital cage. Uh, 
So what I'm really saying is know yourself, right? I mean, the goal of spiritual growth is to know yourself, to face the worst you think about yourself, see it, see it's not worse, it's human. We're just human and integrate it in yourself so you can transcend it and be a more actionable agent of, of what results as what we call freedom as a result of that kind of integration and integrity. In order to do this in the security space, we have to look at what are the deep politics of the security space. I use that term from Peter Dale Scott, who teaches at Berkeley and has written a lot of books like Deep Politics and the Death of JFK. He's not concerned with who killed JFK because so many people justifiably wanted him dead that it could have been any of them. And any of the scenarios, in the absence of further evidence, uh, could have been the right scenario. Uh, it, it, it certainly could have been the Cubans. It could have been the Vietnamese payback for, for Jin uh, being assassinated. It could have been the Mafia, of course, because his dad was Mafia. His dad grew in Boston, worked with the Mafia, distributed liquor, uh, bootlegger. Um, his dad got into such trouble, he had to have a sit-down with Sam Jin Khan in Chicago, my town. Uh, and have him take a contract off his head. And they did, they worked it out. I had uh, uh, Charlie Fischetti lived upstairs of our apartment in the apartment building I grew up in Chicago. He was uh, Capone's lieutenant um, until he died of a heart attack in Miami. And you just grew up in this, in this milieu. So anybody could have killed Kennedy, but what he wanted to focus on was the important distinction between traditional conspiracy theory conscious secret collaborations towards shared ends, and deep political analysis, which is the study of those practices and arrangements, whether or not deliberate, which are usually repressed rather than acknowledged. In the latter, there is an open system with divergent power centers and goals, not a single objective or control point. So it's not like somebody is doing this to us. It's that there's a convergence of mutual self-interest and an unwillingness to acknowledge the truth, for example, of the security industry, and what it does, it's kind of like a guy, when I was working on a project on intelligence and ethics with some people, and I talked to a guy in the Navy, he said, we have a moral code, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. We don't say don't kill, because the only reason we exist is to kill. So if you filtered that one in, it would change the paradigm of calling it a, a moral code, or an ethical code, or whatever they call it. Uh, in addition, as a result of the morphing geopolitical structures into meta-national stage-managed globalism, the sources of power, the references, the points of reference for power in the world are not what they think. Concrete example, I did a talk for the FBI in Chicago and the special agent in charge of the Chicago office talked about it's not your father's FBI anymore. He said we were instantiated, uh, stood up as a police agency in America and we don't go foreign. But now as a result of boundaries dissolving we have to go foreign and do intelligence all the time. The flip side of that is the CIA was instantiated to break all of the laws it could in its mission in all other countries except ours, but now it's impossible to say where ours ends and the others begin. Uh, in other words, foreign and domestic, like natural and artificial in the world of biology, no longer make meaningful distinctions because the grayness and fuzziness in the middle has expanded all the way to the edges. There is no foreign and domestic when you're looking at the sources of power. And What the special agent at the FBI said is, I used to be able to appeal straight up to the patriotism of people we're working with to do X, Y, or Z on behalf of our country, and they find now it is in conflict with their allegiance and the sources of their uh, authority and power and money which comes from meta-national structures which do not yet have names but to which the money in its flows continues to point. So I'm not making this up. Criminal structures are sustained or tolerated by police. They always have been. Whitey Bulger in, uh, in Boston, for example, working closely with the FBI, uh, the integration of crime and legitimacy is the way it is. Crime and legitimacy interpenetrate one another. You can't have one without the other. So, I wrote at the New Paradigms for Security workshop, information security is one task, both offensive and defensive, of the intelligence community sanctions breaking foreign laws while prohibiting similar activities on American soil. But simple distinctions of foreign and domestic no longer hold. 
the convergence of enabling technologies of intrusion, interception, and panoptic reach, combined with a sense of urgency about the counter-terror imperative and a clear mandate from our leaders to do everything possible to defeat an amorphous non-state enemy, enemy defined by behaviors rather than boundaries, borders, or even clear ideological allegiance, has created an ominous but invisible and seemingly inevitable set of conditions that undermine previous cornerstones of law, ethics, and even religious traditions. Therefore, IT and security professionals exercise an implicit thought leadership because you create the structures that bind and inform society and civilization. Your real charge is not to defend and protect the nation any longer, but to stabilize the world. This is not your father's world anymore either. So we have to assure people that they must wake up in a safe and sane environment because otherwise uh, things fall apart. Now, we're doing all this in a deeper context yet, in a context of a world within the world, a secretive world, a secret world, which since 9-11 has grown and grown and grown. I had dinner not long ago with someone who helps to write the protocols and policies of governments uh, on intrusion and detection. Uh, I said, are we ever going to get freedom from intrusion and surveillance back? She laughed. It was easy. Of course not. She knows how deeply uh, the structures of authority and power have been uh, penetrated by those, uh, those technologies. Uh, we're never going to get them back. In the Washington Post, Dana Priest wrote, the top secret world the government created in response to the terrorist attacks of September 11th has become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive that no one knows how much it costs, how many people it employs, how many programs exist within it, or exactly how many agencies do the same work. There are 1,270 government organizations and 1,900 private companies on programs related to counterterror, homeland security and intelligence in over 10,000 locations across the country. Almost a million people hold top security clearances. 33 building complexes for top secret intelligence work have been built just since September 2001. Many security and intelligence agencies do the same work creating redundancy, 50,000 intelligence reports each year, a volume so large that many are routinely ignored. After it happened, because they were traumatized by it, trauma leads to, sometimes to speech. Someone described the scene in the office of the director of the NSA when he told senior officials the new executive order mandated X, Y, and Z, and the silence was frozen because, he said, these are things we had been told all our professional lives we did not do. We do not do that because it violates the law and the Constitution. Unless we recontextualize the Fourth Amendment so that it makes some sense in a world without walls, it will continue to have less and less meaningful application. And as Michael Hayden said, when asked if there were not ethical implications or legal implications, to vacuuming up the communications of Americans without court order or warrant. He said, we don't have to worry about those because, quote, we have the power, unquote. That's the world in which we do our work and on behalf of which we do our work, but you do not hear it spoken of at conferences like Black Hat. It is the given. It is the unspoken premise and assumption that the economy based on that secret world will continue to manifest itself as a military, industrial, entertainment, media, educational complex in which the nexus of power, one to the other, is so close and tight that one becomes indistinguishable from the other. In my uh, short story, in Mind Games, I only brought a few, right? Pitch, right? Not supposed to be a vendor pitch. I have half a dozen of these if anybody wants one signed. And for only five bucks, the few remaining in print, Islands in the Clipstream, it's gone all electronic. Five bucks for that one. Twenty bucks for that one. Five bucks for that. I have five of each. It's really a prize, and it will be worth a great deal of money one day. <laughs> uh, the older I get, the better I was. And uh, when I'm dead, my value will be through the roof. <laughs> okay.
So we don't usually discuss the simple reality of the sources of research and development in the world which funds our enterprise. It's just a given. People deal with one another. They do not always ask from where the money comes. You do not always know in different false flag operations. Ten minutes? Are you kidding? Jesus. <laughs> All right, forget, but forget that. Uh, <laughs> All right. God, the, the meat of this, and they're all in that, on that CD, but let me just start rattling them off um, and, and make this kind of fit, is what hackers and security professionals really say when we talk to one another in the privacy of our uh, sh shared spaces, okay? Uh, one stood at the vendor space at Black Hat last year with me and looked out at the sea of booths and the beach bunnies and, and the booth bunnies, I mean, and, and all the swag, the chocolates and the pens and the glowing lighted balls and said, do you know not one of these people can deliver on the promise they make, which is to secure the enterprise. Not one of these people can deliver on their promise. They are selling something that cannot do what they claim, which is protect and secure the enterprise. And when I mentioned that a particular application was based on smoke and mirrors to the editor of a major national security information security publication, he laughed and said, Richard, our industry is based on smoke and mirrors. A quote which you heard me say was said by the editor of the magazine, but CNN yesterday reported, and Richard Thiem said the whole industry is based on smoke and mirrors. Every attributed statement I made at Black Hat, they removed the quotes, interwoven things out of context, and brought in statements made by others and wove those in too. It was a nice piece. It just had very little to do with what was actually said and the way it was said. Uh, I just point that out. All right, we identify the threats that we can fight not the threats we cannot fight. We sell what we can sell, not what we can't sell. Uh, cryptography is a great example. Cryptography is the opiate of the naive. Uh, because, sure, it can protect a lot of things, but not if the system is broken. Peter Neumann was talking to uh, Rivest about voting machines, and Rivest said the cryptography is terrific on the voting machines, and Peter Neumann said, yes, but the entire system is broken. And Rivest, the cryptographer, said, that's not my problem. Right? Holistic thinking at its best, right? And he's a really smart guy. I remember someone laughing at the ATM and other embedded device code he was looking at because it was so simple and easy to exploit, one hacker said. In my non-expert opinion, I would say the cell phone stuff is even easier. And another added mobile device security implementations currently suck more than the abomination that we call mainstream software. Okay? Dan Geer pointed out, by name, the financial world has proven by demonstration that we humans are abundantly capable of building systems we can neither understand nor control. The digital world is insisting on a second round of proof. Just as the greatest enemy of our personal health is ubiquitous cheap food, the greatest enemy of our national health is ubiquitous cheap connectivity. You know that the applications being added by the thousands and the smartphones being added by the thousands simply increase the coves and niches of the coastline of the attack interface. So there's a whole section that I won't even touch on what the FBI is actually doing in Cointel Pro 2.0. I will skip the section on Emil Durkheim, which you can read about, in which he pointed out that criminality and legitimacy necessarily interpenetrate one another in any society. And I'm going to skip the point about what the banking system is actually sustaining and supporting, uh, a, a, an example of which is how much money is effectively laundered uh, through that system. I will give you a couple of quotes. U.S. and European banks launder between $500 billion and a trillion dollars of dirty money each year, half of which is in the U.S. loan. Senator Carl Levin summarizes, estimates are up to a trillion of international criminal proceeds are moved internationally and deposited in bank accounts. Uh, between two and a half and five trillion have been laundered by U.S. banks and circulated. Uh, the flow of corrupt money and transition, from transitional economies is 20, 40 to 40 billion dollars. Uh, the result of this is without the dirty money, the U.S. economy external accounts would be totally unsustainable, living standards would plummet, the dollar would weaken, the available investment and in loan capital would shrink, and Washington would not be able to sustain its global empire. I'm not making it up. I'm just saying the banks do this, and it's not just American banks. UBS, the Vatican Bank, uh, Barclays, around the world. 
uh, as well as Citigroup. Bank of America has a beautiful statement on their policies and money laundering, completely contradicted by their actual practice. Wells Fargo, Wachovia, was just fined over a million million dollars because they laundered over a billion dollars on behalf of the cartels in Mexico, which are fighting one another to death, killing th over 35,000 people. They laundered so much money through Wells Fargo that it equaled one-third of the Mexican GDP, and Wells Fargo's claim was that no one at the bank noticed. Okay. <laughs> All right, so 3,000 died on 9-11. I'm sorry. I love bond traders and firemen and policemen, too. But 35,000 have died in the cartel wars, which are enabled and sustained by the banking system, which it is the primary purpose of the security industry to protect. Who is always cited as the five minutes? Okay. Who's always cited as the first line of defense? The financial institutions must be defended and protected so people can know they will wake up in a secure and safe world, as we have been for the last few years, of course. This is just the way it is. All the documentation on all the banking systems I cite and talk about are on the CD. So let's get back to what hackers or security professionals are saying about this. They are saying, in my humble opinion, the focus is on stuff to be placed on top of a flawed underlying foundation. We can never get to acceptable levels of insosec InfoSec, unless either A, we rip out the networks and start from scratch, or change the competence of government and corporate InfoSec folks to not tolerate mediocrity and empower them with the authority, resources, and support to do what it takes to do it right. Otherwise, good money goes after bad and the status quo is maintained. I no longer do pen tests or red teams because nobody learns from what we find. They just want to check the box of compliance. So why bother? I'm not making a difference anymore. Remember what I said about InfoSec professionals beginning to feel overwhelmed by the impossibility of doing the job. Why bother? I'm not making a difference. If clients don't care, except for making a nice profit on a gig, which is where it goes and you become cynical, then I know I'll be ignored, so why should I? Another said, the problem is to tell the truth, you have to one, not be a vendor, and two, be willing to spill the beans on getting owned. There are very few people willing to get up and say, I work security. My job is to prevent intrusions. We get owned a lot so I kind of fail at my job. Sometimes it is really, really bad, and here's how we deal with it. In other words, manage the risk so people can wake up feeling, oh yes, this or that happened, uh, RSA, et cetera, whatever. Uh, even when we do our jobs right, we're gonna get owned. The real challenge is get business leaders to accept that reality and let us redirect funding to programs that help companies deal with it. Attacks are simple, defense is hard, it is gradual, it is continual, it is not sporadic, it is elusive, and it is often boring. You do not hear too much defense presentations at Black Hat. You hear attacks because they're sexy and fun, and it's more fun to blow shit up than keep it from being blown up. That's what a hacker does. I understand that what I'm articulating is not popular. A disciple of Gandhi said, even those of us who loved him rejoiced when he was assassinated because his presence was a constant upward call to be more than we were. And it was a real, he didn't say it this way in Urdu, he said it was a pain in the ass, but that's what he meant. It is a pain in the ass to look at this stuff and try to deal with it and not forget it, suppress it, and ignore it the minute we go on to the next presentation. What is the step of the craft? We're not willing to ask the next round of hard questions because we haven't realized yet that what we've got is broken. There are people out there still trying to perfect AV and IDS mousetraps. No big data solution will magically solve the problem of I have to see it first in order to detect it later. 80% of viruses might be stopped, 20% don't. When you are owned, you are owned. Risk and accountability, our inability to identify and convey technology risks kills us. Executives don't get it. We don't therefore have the conversation at the place of power and authority where it will make a difference to begin grasping what we're doing. And yet what is doing, the shocking thing is the HBG fiasco, which I loved someone describing as a, a bi bi uh, biker's suck bumper sticker at a Harley rally. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't be stupid. Uh, he said software security problems and all sorts of goods and services, check. Greater societal dependence on the technology, check. Greater complexity, check. Everybody selling zero days to God knows who for money, check. Professional development of digital weaponry, check. 
A black market economy? Check. Industrial espionage? Check. Leaked information? Targeted? Traded? Check. Intelligence agencies outside the U.S. growing capabilities, like Iran saying after Stuxnet, in the future we will have to consider preemptive action. Those of you who know, know that Stuxnet is the one in the public, so we can talk about it like waterboarding, but there have been others and some of them are serious and portend worse things for the future. What keeps me up at night, a guy asked in an interview the other night, what keeps me up at night is when the chief technologist at CIA tells me he can't sleep at night. That's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> he says reading the FISA intercepts gives him nightmares, but I can't tell you what's in them. Thank you, you've done your job. Secondary trauma, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the real question is not how much security do I need until I have no risk? It's how much do I need until I can live comfortably with the real risks I am facing. Have the conversation. Okay, I'm finishing. I've only got 10 minutes. Wasn't that an X? Wasn't that a Roman numeral X? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, let me, let me wrap it up. Um, uh -oh. No, I'm next speaker. Oh, you're next Let me just wrap it up by saying build networks with the people who are really your friends. Let me tell you how I knew who they are. <laughs> the guy came up to me about a few years ago at, uh, when I had too much to say for a change, and, and the people were saying, cut. And the guy who does the audio, this is cut, but the guy who does the audio said, uh, because he'd read my book and loved it, he said, there are two people I won't cut, Martin Luther King Jr., he's dead, and you. So, uh, make friends with the little people, right? <laughs>